Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 101, Lecture 21. In this lecture, we'll discuss resistive forces. This topic is covered in Chapter 6 of our textbook by Surway and Jouette. An object moving through a fluid, i.e. gas or liquid, experiences a resistive force. So whenever an object is moving through a fluid, there is a force that resists its motion that tends to slow it down, and that force is referred to as a resistive force. Notice that we're using the word fluid in its technical sense here. Technically, the word fluid refers to gases and liquids together. So although uh, gases and liquids are two different phases of matter, they exhibit many of the same properties, so the word fluid is used to refer to both phases together. Whenever an object moves through either one of these materials, it experiences a resistive force. For example, when a submarine or a torpedo moves through water, there is a resistive force acting on it that is slowing it down. Similarly, when a parachutist is falling through air, that's a gas, uh, it is experiencing a resistive force that is slowing it down. You might be wondering where does this resistive force come from? What is its fundamental cause? And on a microscopic level, resistive forces are a consequence of collisions between the object and the atoms or molecules of the fluid. So if you imagine, for example, just a box falling to the ground, as that box falls to the ground, it has to essentially push these air molecules out of the way. A little more precisely, as the box falls, each one of these air molecules is going to collide with the box and then ricochet off out of the way. Each one of those collisions is going to exert a tiny, tiny force on the box. Now the force is tiny, but there are many, many of these molecules in its path. The sum total of all those forces tend to have a significant influence in slowing down the box. That influence, the sum of all of those forces, is referred to as the resistive force acting on the box. The magnitude and direction of uh, resistive forces depend on the velocity of the object. So if the ob object is um, falling downwards, if the velocity is in this direction, then the resistive force will be in this direction. In other words, as each one of these molecules collides with the box and maybe ricochets off, it exerts an upwards force, and the sum of all those forces gives you this resistive force, which we denote using the letter R, and it will point up. On the other hand, if we were talking about maybe a submarine or a torpedo, for example, moving horizontally underwater, we would then say that the velocity vector, let's just say, points like this, in which case the collisions are now exerting a force to the right, so we would say that the resistive force is pointing in the right direction. So the direction of this resistive force depends on what the object is doing, it depends on the velocity of the object. It also depends on the speed of the object, if the object is moving uh, more rapidly with a greater speed, then the collisions are going to be a little more violent, right? If you're going to be involved in a car accident, for example, you would like it to be at 10 miles per hour and not at 100 miles per hour. So the faster the object moves through the fluid, the more violent these collisions will be, the more forceful these collisions will be, and therefore the greater the resistive force. Now, because of this complicated microscopic nature of resistive forces, resistive forces tend to be very difficult to study. It helps if we divide resistive forces into different categories. In this class, we'll be interested in two specific types of resistive forces. We'll talk about the viscous force, also known as the force of viscosity, and we'll talk about the drag force, also known as air resistance. So air resistance, viscosity, drag, these are all really just examples of resistive forces. On a microscopic level, all of these forces are the result of collisions between one object 
and the atoms of the surrounding medium, the surrounding fluid. We'll talk about the viscous force in detail next, and after that we'll talk about the drag force in detail. Let's discuss the viscous force in more detail. Viscosity, or the viscous force, acts on an object when it moves through a liquid at low speeds. So, in general, objects moving through any kind of a fluid experience a resistive force, but when they are moving through a liquid specifically and at relatively low speeds, the resistive force that they encounter is referred to as viscosity or the viscous force. Viscosity is proportional to speed, more precisely, we say that the resistive force of viscosity is equal to V times V. V is the speed of the object that is moving through the liquid, and B is the reduced viscosity coefficient. It's a number that depends on the properties of the medium and the shape and size of the object. In general, the bigger the object is, the blockier the object is, the larger its reduced viscosity coefficient will be, but also the properties of the medium matter. In general, thicker liquids have higher viscosity. So for example, moving through water is relatively easy, but moving through honey or molasses or oil, these are thicker liquids, uh, moving through these thicker liquids is more difficult. In this figure here, you see uh, four different test tubes filled with four different types of uh, motor oil. This is the type of oil that you might put in the engine of your automobile. In each case, a ball bearing is dropped into the motor oil, and the speed with which the ball bearing travels through this motor oil depends on the viscosity or the viscous force that the liquid exerts on the ball bearing. In fact, if you've ever changed the engine oil in your car, if you've had to purchase motor oil, you know that motor oil is often rated. Um, they come rated as 10W30 or 20W40. Those numbers refer to a range of viscosity values for that oil. And the way that the Society of Automotive Engineers determines these viscosity coefficients is by dropping a standard size ball bearing into the oil and timing the, um, the travel of the ball bearing from the top to the bottom of the test tube. As you can see, the viscosity rating, the viscosity coefficient for the oil on the right is the highest, and the oil on the left is the lowest. This implies that on the right, this ball bearing, as it moves through the liquid, encounters the largest viscous force, so it's slowed down more compared to the other ones, and therefore it takes a longer time to reach the bottom of the test tube. The second type of resistive force that we want to discuss is the drag force. Drag acts on an object when it moves through a gas at high speeds. So whereas the viscous force is all about liquids, drag is all about gases. Drag is also related to the speed of the object. More precisely, drag is proportional to speed squared. So as this equation here indicates, the resistive force of drag is equal to alpha times v squared, where v is the speed of the moving object. Alpha is known as the reduced drag coefficient. It's the analog of b in the case of the viscous force. And like that coefficient, alpha depends on properties of the medium and the shape and size of the object. If we're talking about, for example, a parachute, then the reduced drag coefficient is, is going to be quite large. A parachute is designed to maximize the amount of drag or air resistance, and therefore alpha for um, this particular shaped object, the parachute, is going to be quite large. If you're designing a sports car, on the other hand, you want to minimize alpha. You want the reduced drag coefficient for this uh, Porsche here to be as small as possible. In fact, automobile manufacturers measure the reduced drag coefficient of their designs by placing the cars inside wind tunnels and measuring the force um, that air exerts on the object.
Drag is a very common force, and so we want to develop a deeper understanding of the drag force. As we just discussed, the drag force is equal to alpha v squared. So the faster the object goes, the greater the resistive force of drag. But of course, alpha also plays a key role. Alpha can be measured directly, but it can also be calculated using this formula here. It is not at all obvious where this formula comes from, and we will not derive it in this class. For us, what is important is simply how to use this formula. According to this formula, alpha is equal to one half d a rho. d is the drag coefficient. Don't confuse it with alpha, which is the reduced drag coefficient. a is the cross-sectional area of the object and rho is the density of the gas through which the object is moving. If a person is parachuting to Earth and he's moving through the Earth's atmosphere, then this density would be the density of air, and in that case we refer to drag as air resistance. But it is possible to move through other gases. For example, when um, the Martian rovers were landing on Mars, NASA designed the mission so that the rovers would parachute down to the Martian surface through the Martian atmosphere. Mars's atmosphere um, is not made of air, it's primarily carbon dioxide. So in that case, as the rovers were parachuting through the atmosphere, the drag force could be calculated by considering the density of carbon dioxide. So this formula really works for any type of a gas, so long as you know the density of the gas. The cross-sectional area requires a little bit of an explanation. The cross-sectional area is the area that encounters gas molecules. It's essentially the area that is pushing gas molecules out of the way. For example, if we imagine a cylindrical shaped object falling through the atmosphere, we can see that as the object falls through the atmosphere, it has to essentially clear a path in its way and this path essentially itself looks like a cylindrical column. So any molecule that is in the path of the cylinder is gonna to have to get displaced, push out of the way. If there is a molecule that is outside of this path, it's not going to collide. So for example, a molecule that might be here or here or here is not going to be colliding with the cylinder, but any molecule that essentially is in the path of this cross-sectional area here will encounter a collision and therefore will, exi uh, will exert a resistive force. So the cross-sectional area in this case is going to be uh, pi r squared. We would have to know the radius of the base of the cylinder in order to calculate A. Now suppose we're talking about a different uh, shape falling through air. Suppose what's falling through the air is this um, conical shape over here. The conical shape on the right obviously has a different geometric shape, but as it falls through the air, again, it has to clear essentially the same area. So a molecule that's here is not going to collide uh, with the cone, but a molecule that is here or here will collide. So the relevant cross-sectional area ends up being the same as the cylinder. It's again, this largest cross-sectional area of the cone that matters. So when it comes to calculating A, both the cone and the cylinder have the same cross-sectional area, it's pi r squared. Now you might be thinking, but wait a second, the cone in some sense is more aerodynamic, it's probably going to fall faster, right, because of its um, sharp point. Uh, so what distinguishes the cylinder from the cone? And the answer is the drag coefficient. So although the cone and the cylinder have the same cross-sectional area, the drag coefficient for the cylinder is going to be larger. In fact, when we talk about a shape being quote-unquote aerodynamic, we're often talking about the drag coefficient. The aerodynamic properties of an object depend primarily on the drag coefficient for that object. If an object is highly aerodynamic, then its drag coefficient d is a small number, but if it's blocky and non-aerodynamic, then its drag coefficient um, is a large number. This table here lists the drag coefficient for some common shapes. 
you don't need to memorize any of these numbers, but given one of these numbers, you need to know how to use it to calculate the reduced drag coefficient and the resistive force. In this table, we're imagining that the shapes are at rest and wind or air is blowing from left to right. Equivalently, you can imagine that the air is at rest and the object is moving to the left. According to the table, the drag coefficient for a sphere is 0.47. But the drag coefficient of a blockier shape, like a cube, is larger. It's 1.5. This indicates that if the sphere and the cube have the same cross-sectional area and they are moving at the same speed, then the cube would encounter roughly twice as much drag compared to the sphere. The most aerodynamic shape in this table is the so-called streamlined body, um, which has a very low drag coefficient. The streamlined body is actually the cross-sectional uh, shape of airplane wings. So airplane wings in cross-section are designed to look like a streamlined body because the goal there is to minimize the, the resistive force of drag. Automobile manufacturers are often interested in the drag coefficient for their cars. As you can see from this table, Porsche 911 has a relatively low drag coefficient. So when the Porsche is driving on a highway at high speeds, it encounters less drag. But a Hummer, which is a big blocky car, is going to have a larger drag coefficient. So this is not at all an aerodynamic car. When driving at high speeds, this car encounters a huge amount of air resistance. And when driving on the highway, most of the gasoline that is used is used to actually overcome air resistance. So the drag coefficient plays an important part in determining the fuel efficiency of an automobile. We've been talking about the drag force, the reduced drag coefficient, and the drag coefficient. And on the previous slide, I gave you some numerical values for the drag coefficients of different shapes but you may have noticed that I did not include the SI units with any of those numbers. So here, let's figure out the SI unit for the drag coefficient D. In general, whenever you encounter a new quantity and you want to figure out its units, what you want to do is find an equation in which that quantity appears. For us, this is the equation that includes the drag coefficient. Earlier, we wrote this equation a little bit differently. Earlier, we wrote it as R drag is equal to alpha V squared. Alpha, of course, was this entire thing over here. So here, I've fleshed out the equation. I've included all of the details in the formula for the drag force. Now, when you have an equation, you want the units for everything on the left side to match the units for everything on the right side. So if you want your equation to be valid, numerically, the left side must be equal to the right side, but the units must also match on both sides of the equation. The left side, of course, is the drag force, and like all forces, drag is also measured in newtons, and a newton, of course, is a kilogram meter per second squared. We express that fact by writing it like so. When we place square brackets around the quantity, we're saying that we are interested in the unit for that quantity. We're not so much interested in the numerical value of the drag force here. We're simply interested in the unit for drag force. So the square brackets indicate units of. Here we're saying that the unit for the drag force is the Newton. And we learned earlier that a newton is really a kilogram meter per second squared. The right side is a little more complicated. If we want to calculate the unit of everything on the right side, then we need to look at the individual units. One half is just a number. It has no units, so we can ignore it. The unit for D is the thing that we're after. So I want to write that as D with square brackets around it. So the goal is to figure this out. A is the cross-sectional area in the SI system. We measure that in meters squared. Rho is the density of the gas in the SI system. We measure that as kilograms per cubic meter. And V is the speed, but of course it's speed squared. So we're going to take meters per second and square it to get meters squared per second squared. 
Simplify this expression a little bit and you find that you get the units for D, whatever that is, times kilograms meters per second squared. As you compare the units on the left side to the units on the right side, you realize that D must be unitless. So on the left side, we have kilogram meters per second squared. And on the right side, we have kilogram meters per second squared times the unit for D. As you can see already, these units here match these units here. So D is a unitless quantity. It's a pure number, something like pi, for example. A very fancy way of expressing that is to say that the units for D is kilograms to the zeroth power times meters to the zeroth power times seconds to the zeroth power, which of course all just becomes one free of units. So D is a unitless quantity. This practice problem involves the drag force. A skydiver with a mass of 75 kilograms and cross-sectional area of 0.7 square meters jumps out of an airplane. His drag coefficient is 0.476 and the density of air is 1.255 kilograms per cubic meter. Based on this information, calculate the maximum speed the skydiver can achieve. So this person is jumping out of an airplane and he has not yet opened his parachute so he's going to essentially fall faster and faster because gravity is acting on him. Gravity is pulling him downwards and helping him speed up. As it turns out, there is a maximum speed that he can achieve um, given the fact that there is some air resistance acting on him. After all, we know the cross-sectional area, we know the drag coefficient, we know the density of the air through which he's jumping. So we can, in theory, calculate the drag force on his body and figure out what is the maximum speed that he can achieve as he falls uh, through air. To better understand uh, why there is a maximum speed to begin with, let's consider the, um, the motion of this uh, skydiver in stages. So here we have the airplane, and suppose the airplane is just moving straight with a constant speed. And here we have the ground. We're going to assume that the airplane is quite high um, so that the skydiver has at least a few minutes um, to essentially fall through the air to reach his maximum speed. When the skydiver first steps out of the airplane, there's really only one force acting on him. At least in the vertical direction, the only force that's acting on the skydiver is the weight of the skydiver. So mg, basically, pointing in the negative y direction. When he first steps out of the airplane, there is no drag force acting on him, at least in the vertical direction, simply because um, he doesn't have any speed. Remember that the drag force is equal to alpha v squared, and when he first steps out of the airplane, his velocity is zero, and so the drag force is zero. Now again, I'm focusing in the y direction. We're not really interested in what's happening in the x direction. Here, we're primarily interested in the falling motion or the vertical motion of the skydiver. So at this initial point, if I were to calculate the sum of all forces in the y direction, so the net y force, I would say it is simply equal to minus mg, so the weight of the skydiver. However, after a few seconds, the skydiver has now fallen. Gravity has helped him accelerate, so he's going faster. And because he's going faster, he has some speed now, so there is some air resistance acting on him. So alpha v squared is no longer zero. So now there are two forces acting on the skydiver. There is his weight, that hasn't changed, that's still mg. But now there is a small upward force, and that's the resistive force. He's falling downwards. As he's falling, he's colliding with air molecules. These air molecules push up on him, opposing his velocity. So there's going to be some amount of resistive force acting on the skydiver. Now, if we were to calculate the net vertical force, we would say it's minus mg plus r. Notice r is positive because it's pointing in the positive y direction. Now, as the skydiver falls, 
he gains speed. He is accelerating downwards, so he's going faster and faster and faster. As he goes faster and faster, weight does not change, but drag or air resistance does change. Remember, drag is alpha v squared, so as v increases, drag also increases. So if we were to watch this skydiver as he falls, as he goes faster and faster, this vector gradually becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. At some point during the fall, the vector that is pointing up might match the vector that is pointing down. So after a few seconds, what happens is we still have weight, mg, that hasn't changed, but now we have a much larger drag force that is pointing up. And by this point, the drag force has grown so big that it is equal in magnitude to the weight of the skydiver. At that moment, when it happens, the net force on the skydiver becomes zero. So the two forces cancel each other out. Weight is pulling him down, drag is pushing him up. But these two forces pointing in opposite directions balance each other out. So the net force becomes zero. Now the net force becomes zero, that does not mean that the velocity becomes zero. At this point, the skydiver has gained a lot of speed and is moving very rapidly, but the net force is zero, which means that the acceleration is going to be zero. So at this point, the acceleration in the y direction is going to be zero, and we know this by Newton's second law of motion. We know that the net force is equal to mass times acceleration, if the net force is zero, the acceleration is zero. If the acceleration is zero, what that tells us is that the speed of the skydiver is not going to change. From this point on, the skydiver will fall with a constant velocity. He's already going very, very fast, but that's going to be the fastest that he will ever go. So a little bit later, if we were to analyze the forces acting on the skydiver, we would see that air resistance has remained the same at its maximum value, and weight, of course, is constant throughout the problem, and the acceleration basically remains constant all the way to the ground, or at least until he opens his parachute and radically alters the aerodynamics of his body. So at this moment in time, when the acceleration becomes zero, when the net force becomes zero, he's achieved his maximum speed. To calculate this, this maximum speed, we'll actually use this equation here um, to solve for velocity. So continuing the same problem, we can now actually calculate the maximum speed. Remember that if the speed is at its maximum, then the acceleration must be zero. If the acceleration is not zero, if the skydiver is still going faster and faster, then that's not the maximum speed. If we want to talk about the maximum speed, the acceleration must be zero. If the acceleration is zero, the net force must be zero. We know what the net force is. It's minus mg plus r, so weight pulling down and the resistive force pushing up. And we know something about the resistive force. The resistive force is alpha v squared, and we know that alpha is one half dA rho. Putting all of that together, we find that the net force is minus mg plus one half dA rho v squared, and that must equal to zero if we're interested in the maximum speed. Notice we now have an equation that has v in it, speed, that's the thing we were trying to find. And if you solve for v, you'll see that v is equal to the square root of 2mg over dA rho. The square root is coming from the fact that we have v squared here. If you now plug in the mass of the skydiver and his drag coefficient and his cross-sectional area, you'll see that this speed comes out to be about 60 meters per second or 134 miles per hour. So the skydiver is going to be going very, very fast but he will not be able to go faster than 134 miles per hour, no matter how high he is in the atmosphere, no matter how many seconds or minutes he's been falling. Of course, if he's interested in increasing his maximum speed, then he can maybe reduce 
the cross-sectional area of his body by maybe tucking in his limbs. He can also make himself more aerodynamic. For example, if he's doing a belly flop, he can reorient his body so that he's diving head first, and that would actually reduce the drag coefficient, increasing his maximum speed. This maximum speed is often referred to as the terminal velocity because in some sense it's the final velocity of the skydiver. It's the fastest that he will ever go. In this lecture, we've been discussing resistive forces. And if you've been listening carefully, you may have noticed that resistive forces are quite similar to friction. Both of them tend to slow down objects or resist their motion. In fact, some people refer to air resistance as air friction. Even some older textbooks use the phrase air friction when discussing air resistance or drag. However, I want to encourage you to avoid this terminology. I encourage you to use phrases like air resistance and drag, but not air friction. And the reason is that friction and resistive forces are fundamentally different. There are some key differences between them, and confusing them could only be dangerous. To better understand the differences, it's helpful to do a side-by-side -side comparison. To begin with, on a microscopic level, friction is the result of contact forces, atoms of one object coming in contact with atoms of the other object, but they don't necessarily need to be moving relative to one another. Resistive forces, on the other hand, are the result of collisions, so motion is uh, crucial to the idea of a resistive force. Friction uh, involves one solid object in contact with another solid object, so when it comes to friction we're talking about two solid objects, like a box sitting on a table. However, resistive forces involve one solid object, in contact with a fluid, so a liquid or a gas. So the materials involved um, in resistive forces are different. Perhaps most importantly, the magnitude of friction is independent of speed, whereas magnitude of resistive forces very much depend on speed. If you're talking about the viscous force, then the magnitude is a first order polynomial of speed, so it's a linear function of speed. If you're talking about the drag force, then it's a second order polynomial of speed or a quadratic function of speed, but speed definitely matters. When an object goes twice as fast or three times as fast, the resistive force increases. That's not the case with friction. Well, to be fair, we have static friction and we have kinetic friction. If an object is not moving, it experiences static. If it is moving, it experiences kinetic friction. But that's really it. Kinetic friction doesn't really care how fast the object is moving. The force of kinetic friction on a moving object is the same whether the object is moving at 1 meter per second or 10 meters per second or 100 meters per second. So friction is really independent of the actual value of speed. The static friction points opposite other parallel forces, so it is a reactive force. Notice it's not opposing the velocity. The object is not even moving in the case of static friction. Um, kinetic friction does point, the objects, uh, does point opposite to the object's velocity. Both of, the both of the resistive forces that we've discussed, both drag and the viscous force, force uh, point opposite the object's velocity. So these two forces, in some sense, are similar to kinetic friction, but not at all similar to static friction. Neither one of the resistive forces is a reactive force, whereas static friction is very much a reactive force. So keep these differences in mind, because you may encounter situations where you have both friction and resistive in play, and you will have to be able to separate these forces in order to carry out the analysis. And that's the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.